The way we lead impacts the way people live. This world needs truly human leadership. I'm Brent Stewart, your host. Thanks for listening. This podcast is an outreach of Barry Waymiller. You can connect with us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter at Barry Waymiller and find our podcasts, articles, and videos at trulyhumanleadership.com. You're listening to a Truly Human Leadership podcast refresher where we reshare insight from podcast episodes from the past. Richard Sheridan is the CEO and founder of Menlo Innovations, a software development company based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Rich has been working in computer programming for more than 40 years. When he first began his career, he loved it so much he couldn't believe people would actually pay him to do it. Along the way, however, that joy became disillusionment. Eventually, Rich was able to recapture that optimism and create an intentional culture based on the business value of joy that helps the people under his care find meaning in their work. He detailed this leadership journey in his book, Joy, Inc. Here's a quote from Rich's introduction to his book that I'm particularly fond of, one that helps to explain his purpose in writing it. Deep down, you know that there is a better way to run a business, a team, a company, a department. You've always known it. These thoughts come to you just before falling asleep or just after waking. Then your day begins and the idea of transformational change evaporates like a maddening dream you can't seem to reassemble after waking from it. Although you may be silently, or not so silently tortured in your current broken company culture, you haven't given up completely. Change is still possible. Rich Sheridan and Menlo Innovations, like Bob Chapman and Barry Waymiller, know there is a better way to lead. That's why we're out here talking about it, because we know others feel the same, but maybe have never experienced it and have no idea where to begin. That's why Barry Waymiller started the BW Leadership Institute, to help other companies understand and institute this change. On this episode of Everybody Matters, I talked to Rich about his journey, about joy, Menlo's culture of joy, and what he thinks makes a great team. So tell me a little bit about Menlo. What, what does Menlo do? You know, at a base level, we are a software design and development firm, so much like a custom home builder. Uh, people come to us with ideas. We form design teams around those ideas, create the design for the software that we're ultimately going to build, and then our software developers turn that design into working software. Uh, we have a fundamentally different belief uh, system around what it takes to build great software. And that's where we end up talking about joy in the context of our business. Talk to me a little bit about that, because I think that's kind of a key thing in talking about what Menlo does. Is, is And I think that this is a, a key differentiator between you and your, and your competition, for sure. Yeah, we, we fundamentally believe that software should not torture people. Uh, <laughs> So we adopted a mission from our very first days to end human suffering in the world as it relates to technology. (laughs) And we take that very seriously, even though it sounds a little tongue in cheek. But most of us have been frustrated at one time or another with either a high tech gadget or a piece of software we depend on every day. And we grab our heads and say, why does it work this way? And, you know, quite frankly, the sad part of our industry is we've come to accept that we call the people we serve stupid users, and then we write dummies mm-hmm. for those poor people. And we believed something completely different. We believed it was possible to delight people with the work of our hearts, our hands, and our minds. And we ultimately chose the word joy to represent what we were trying to produce in the world. We want to delight people so much that they come back to us later and say, I love this song. Mm-hmm. You made my life better because of what you've done with your team to create this kind of software. And we get that on a regular basis. And that's where we derive our joy from. Yeah, if I'm remembering correctly, you guys look at, at a lot of the, the stuff that you do for your customers. You start from almost a sociological perspective. That's right. We have a set of people on our team that are called high-tech anthropologists. I'll say that one more time because everybody misses it the first time I say it. High-tech as in high technology, anthropology. 
And the idea is, in order to understand the people we're trying to serve, we have to go see them in their native environment. Much like Lean would say, go to the Gemba. Mm. We go out into the world and watch the people we're going to serve with the work we're doing. Watch them work in their native environment. Honor them. Honor what they know. Honor their wisdom of the world. Honor their vocabulary, their workflow, their habits. Not that we're repaving over old bumpy cow paths or anything like that. There are certainly efficiencies to be gained in better design. But if we simply try and foist what we computer scientists know in the world, then we're trying to force users to think like computers rather than make the computer think like the people we're trying to serve. This concept of joy, and you kind of talked about it just now, about it extending to your customers and the users of this product, but that joy ultimately ultimately starts internally with your team. So kind of talk a little bit about how you guys have approached uh, making Menlo a joyful environment. Yeah, we don't believe for a second that you can produce joy with the results of your work without having joy in the room. And so we do focus a lot of attention on the internal culture of Menlo. And so, for example, and again, now you you have to get into a little bit more of the, um, call it the seamier side of my industry, we are the industry that termed the coin death march in a business context. Mm. We're the industry of all-nighters, of 24-7, of this idea that you're going to take a bunch of talented, technical people, lock them in a room for days and weeks on end, and hopefully they'll come out with great software. Our, our fundamental belief is that in the world of sustainability, and there's so many discussions these days about sustainability on the planet, whether it's ecosystems or species or climate or energy sources, we think it's time to introduce the word sustainability in the context of business and when we think about the people who work for us. And you know, if you think about lean from a standpoint of what does lean say about a manufacturing plant floor? It says, look, never operate that plant at 100% capacity. If you do that, you run the risk that if one machine breaks, you could shut down the entire productivity of the entire plant. Mm -hmm. Yet, in my industry, we are typically working the humans at 110 or 120% of capacity. And so we've gotten to this point in the world where we've learned to believe we have to treat our machines better than our humans. And I refuse to accept that. So we work 40 hour work weeks here. We mm -hmm. never work weekends. We never deny or delay vacation requests. And when you go on vacation, when you leave the building, you're done working. You, mm -hmm. There are no access from home options. There's no work from vacation option. And we actually have a rule here that says, don't check email when you're on vacation. We want you to enjoy yourself, to refresh and recharge. And quite frankly, there's great business purpose behind all of these things. This isn't about, you know, simply creating a delightful place for people to work, uh, which it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it's also about the quality of the work that we do. Because quite frankly, you can't pick up a Wall Street Journal these days without reading about some software catastrophe in some major <laughs> corporation or the federal government these days. And the fact of the matter is, tired programmers make bad software, and we don't want to do that. So, you know, as Deming said once upon a time, all anyone ever asks for is a chance to work with pride, and we give our team that here. Yeah, yeah. And I know this the design of Menlo, um, with you and your partner, James, that started it, um, it came a lot from your experiences in the corporate world. When you guys started Menlo, did you kind of have exactly what you wanted to do locked down, or did that develop over time? Well, we had a very, very firm idea, which is still in place to this day, based on some shared experiences James and I had when I was a VP of R&D at a public company here in Ann Arbor called Interface Systems. I had brought James into Interface Systems as a consultant to help me do some culture change within my existing technical team. I was the VP of R&D. And over the next two years, James and I essentially retooled that public company, starting with the R&D team, but the effect we had on the rest of the company was pretty dramatic. And effectively, in those two years, we built inside of that tired old public company, a 30-year-old public company that I'd been with about 16 years 
we built what looks like Menlo today. And so it was a tremendous amount of work. It was a lot of experiments. There was a lot of frustrations along the way. But within six months, things were really working well. And within two years, we had a very well-oiled machine going. And then the Internet bubble burst in 2001. And the California company that had bought us shuttered our office. And James and I were out of work. And mm. there was only one thing they couldn't take away from us, and it was what we had learned in those two years. And so we started Menlo based on the learnings of those two years. So, yes, we had a pretty firm idea on day one what it was going to look like, how it was going to operate, what many of the methods and processes were. But, of course, as you know, uh, as you grow, as, as life changes, you continue to adapt, you continue to run experiments. So, you know, there's a lot of Menlo that still looks the same as it does, did on day one. Uh, and there are many other things we've added along the way. Why did you decide to uh, use the phrase joy to describe the environment that you're trying to create, the feeling that you're trying to create around your products, and, and just as a general kind of classification of what it is you're doing? You know, it's interesting. Uh, you, you will relate to this because this gentleman has at least as much impact in your world as he does in mine. Someone had sent me the Simon Sinek video a few years ago, and they had come on a tour, they'd listened to a podcast, they sent me the link, and they said, Rich, you do what Simon tells us to do in this video. And I listened to it, and of course, what Simon tells us to do is start with why. Mm. And you know, in his, my favorite phrase of his is, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Mm. And so we had already been doing tours at Menlo. Uh, we'd been doing them for a long time. And we had a tour group coming in, and I thought the next day, I'd listen to that video, and I thought, you know what? I really don't start with why. I talk about what we do. I talk about how we do it. And maybe eventually I get to the why, but never explicit and never starting with why. Mm -hmm. So I thought, today's going to be the day. I'm going to start with why. And then I thought, well, what am I going to say exactly? And I thought about our mission. I said, you know... We're really about ending human suffering. That's our why. I want everybody in the world to think about Menlo. When they think about Menlo, I want them to think about suffering. No, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped there and I said, wait, no, no. So I read further down in our mission statement that had been up in the wall for all the years of our existence. And down at the bottom, there was this sense that was like just waiting to be rediscovered. And it said our goal since 2001, when we founded the company, is to return joy to one of the most unique endeavors mankind has ever undertaken, the invention of software. And I thought, boom, that's it. That's what we're about. That's our why. Our why is what we like to call the business value of joy. And I said that to the people who walked in the door that morning. I said, welcome to Menlo. You've come to a place that has very intentionally created a culture focused on the business value of joy. And I can tell you, much like Simon predicted, it changed everything. Mm. Uh, it, that day led ultimately to the book being written, to us having this podcast, and to me now speaking around the world, because I can tell you, as I know you guys know this as well as anybody, because you're on the same kind of stage now that, that I am and we are, that the world is desperate mm. to hear the messages we're sharing. Yeah. There is a there are lives of quiet desperation being lived out in work wherever we go and we're like an oasis in the middle of the desert. Yeah. yeah. And I would assume that that probably that you know, it's the same way for us, you know, uh, you know, our book is coming out this fall, Bob's book is coming out this fall and I'm 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 sure that's what led you to writing Joy Inc. Um how did that all – was that something that you entertained for a while? Was it difficult for you to do or was it something you thought, you know what, this needs to be said? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, my wife will attest to this. As long as she's known me, which we were celebrating our 36th wedding anniversary today. <laughs> wow. Even longer than that. I'm sure we're tipping over 40 years now. So we, thank, thank her for sharing you with me for <laughs> yeah, a little bit today. <laughs> we're out to dinner after this, so she's not completely sharing me. <laughs> there are roses on her desk. She actually works here at Menlo, which is a different kind of joy for both of us. It's a delight to have her here. Um, but um, the 
she knew and she knew there was a book inside of me and I knew there was a book inside of me. Uh, the, I love to write. It's a delight for me. Uh, and so I knew there was going to be a book someday. I thought there would probably be a book about Menlo. But when I took this joy message out to the world, there was a woman, uh, Karen Martin, maybe you know her. Uh, she wrote a book called The Outstanding Organization and a book about value stream mapping. Uh, and Karen heard me speak in Phoenix at the ASQ conference on Lean and Six Sigma. And I brought, that was kind of the first big keynote stage. I brought the joy message out on. And she followed up with me and she pursued me like a wounded animal in the forest. She said, you have to write a book about this. And I said, well, I've been thinking about it. She goes, oh, no, you're done thinking. You're writing a book about this. <laughs> and she walked me through. She got me connected to an agent, which got me connected to the publisher. And the rest is history. And it took me 18 months from opening up my laptop to start typing out a book to holding the printed copy in my hand. And I can tell you, it, it was a lot of hard work, as mm -hmm. I'm sure Bob discovered, too. But it was joy, uh, for sure. It was delight. I loved every minute of the process. What was your biggest surprise after writing the book and after the book came out? Because, you know, I've, I, I've seen that you've been doing a lot of speaking engagements and stuff, and I, I'm sure that's a direct result of, of the book coming out. But in terms of, of the message uh, and the response, what was kind of, what's kind of been your biggest surprise so far? You know, I anticipated kind of everything that was going to happen. I told the team, I said, guys, this is going to change everything for us. And they were scared when I said that. You know, they were like, oh, we don't want to change everything. Why does it change everything? I said, no, no, this will be good. I, and what I saw was, I said, look, we're going to get a lot of press attention to begin with. And that certainly happened. I said, my speaking engagements will change. I will move from side sessions to keynote stages. And they, they will be more geographically diverse. And I've been all over the world now speaking on keynote stages. So I anticipated that. Um, I said, tour, tours will change both in count, number of people who visit us, and in composition, who comes. Mm. Boy, that has changed. We, we just, now here we are, June 30th of this year, six months in, we've had over 2,200 visitors come from all over the planet to come visit us, just this year alone. So we're on track to have over 4,000 visitors come through our door. Um, Two years ago, we only did 2,000 visitors for the whole year. So the counts are going up. The people who are coming, the corporate jets who are coming here with executives to spend anywhere from two hours to five days. I said, that's going to change. And it's just the way it, I thought it would. So a lot of stuff that's happening, I thought would happen. What I didn't anticipate was the depth of the connection. Mm. The, the emotion in some ways that this conjured up in people. Mm. I, it, when I had male German engineers in Berlin come up to me with tears on their cheeks mm. after I spoke, after a second standing ovation in Germany, mm. I thought, okay, I'm touching, I'm touching somewhere deep in the soul of people that this is, there's a far greater desperation for this message than I ever anticipated. And uh, that's the part I'm not sure I could have ever come to expect, and it's been humbling. Mm. Why, why do you think that message is so relatable? Because, uh, well, I mean, one of the reasons I think it's relatable, I'll, I'll sort of answer my own question. Uh, when I read the book, it was funny, because I read the book before we came to Menlo to visit, and as soon as I met you and listened to you talk and talked to you for a little bit, the book was completely your voice. And it was completely obvious to me that those were your, your genuine thoughts and your genuine feelings. But, you know, I, I think some of the ways that industry, folks like us and you guys that are trying to get this particular type of message out there, these types of messages out there, is relatability in terms of industries. And, you know, we're in manufacturing, you guys are in software, and software may be a little bit more specific of an industry than, than manufacturing, maybe not these days. But what do you think it is about your message that makes it so relatable to, you know, from software to, um, 
you know, to manufacturing to, uh, you know, a grocery store or, or whatever, you know. And, uh, lawyers, I mean, I'm getting them coming from yeah. there. It's amazing. Um, you know, I think the world bought into a message somewhere along the way that it didn't need to. And I think we're coming to grips with that now. Stan Slap wrote a great book called Bury My Heart at Conference Room B. And in that book, the gist of it for me was that seldom do middle managers get a chance to live out their personal values at work. And so they, they end up being one person in the work world and another person at home, and they end up living a lie for most of their waking hours. And humans don't do that well. It's why most of the advertisements in the evening are for acid reflux medication, and sleep medication, and, you know, itchy skin and all this kind of stuff because we're just living a lie too many of our waking hours. And I think my book is giving the reader permission to start caring again, mm. caring not just about themselves, but the world they're serving. And I think that's the part that connects for everybody. Because I think a lot of people think my industry is the gleaming alloy industry. It's the beautiful yeah. industry. It's filled with the beautiful people, the smart young people that you couldn't possibly have trouble in the software industry, could you? And I present this, you know, this world of death march culture of you know, quality problems, missed deadlines, screaming meetings. And all of a sudden everybody looks and goes, oh. Yeah, my world's like that, too. Mm -hmm. You mean it doesn't need to be? You mean there could possibly be a, a better way of doing things? And I have to say, the other part of my life since the book came out that has just been delightful and, quite frankly, leads directly to why you and I are talking is I get to meet people like Bob Chapman. Mm -hmm. Because I think both Bob and I need something, too. We need to know we're not alone in mm -hmm. this pursuit. We need to know that it's there's a group of us. We we still may be rare. We still may be considered crazy by most of the world. Because you can imagine. I mean, look at my book. Look at the cover of the book. It has the word joy and love, <laughs> on it, and it's a business book. Right? <laughs> Come on, who does that? Right. <laughs> pretty bold move, you know. I, I felt a little vulnerable when that book came out. I thought maybe the world would just laugh at me, and they didn't. They cried. Mm. You know, you had a journey, which your book describes uh, very well, your journey to get to joy. And so a journey, you know, doesn't really end, you, especially with leadership. You, you, you don't just get there and just sit down and take your shoes off. You're, you're still going and you're still learning. Since you've written the book and since, you know, you, you, you're meeting people and things like that, what are some of the things that you're learning on the journey or maybe thinking about where you're at right now and thinking, you know, that's maybe I should be doing, you know, maybe we should. What, what are those kinds of things where you're at right now? Well, you know, I think for me, there's a level of accountability to a book that's kind of unprecedented. Uh, you know, I can talk to the team once a quarter, once a month, every whenever I feel like it. I can lead a tour and say things to people. But boy, when you write it down in a book, and people are coming from all over the planet to see you. Mm. And your team sees you every day and they hear you describing to the world how things work. And when they don't quite work all the way everybody wants it to, because as you say, we're never perfect. We always are working on better problems. Uh, you know, it, it, hold, it holds me to a higher level of accountability, I think, than I ever have been held to before. Mm. I don't mind it. I think it's actually really healthy for me because... Uh, as I tell the world, one of the things is when you embark on this journey, when you take the first step, the first thought in your mind is, how do I need to change? Not how do they need to change? How do we need to change? No, no. This journey has to be personal first. I needed to become a different leader to create Menlo. I needed to be a different kind of thinker. I had to take a different look at the way I led people. And I still do to this day. I'm still learning. I'm still reading. I'm still visiting. I'm still going out in the world and learning from people like you guys. It's, uh, 
and it's delightful. I mean, I mm -hmm. see stuff now. I probably see more now than I used to because we're farther along in the journey. When you spend time thinking about things as deeply as you need to to write a book, it's almost like your senses are tuned more to seeing things that might not have been obvious or you, or maybe they were obvious, but you didn't put any weight on them. And now you see them and you're like, Oh, mm. it's really important. One of the things I think about when I think of Menlo and it's, you know, after reading your book and after visiting there is the fact that it seems like you guys have such a great team there. You know, you guys are close, you know, you've got children on the floor, you've got, you've got bassinets on the floor and looking at a baby right now. And <laughs> little Lucy's here with John. So she's only five months old. <laughs> and to me, you know, it's things like that. It's like, man, that's a, that's a team. You know, these guys are looking out for each other's back. They're even looking out for each other's kids, maybe at various points during the day. Yep. Well, what are kind of some of the things that you feel makes a great team? Yeah, I think number one, and you guys have this so well. You know what? You, you yeah, I'm trying to remember the phrase, and I'm sure you'll correct me. I'll get it close. You know, we we measure our effect by the lives we touch. Yeah. Right. Right. And so the, the to me, for you guys, I look at you, and and I know that. It, that's not only externally focused. Who are you serving in the world? But it's also how you look at the people on your team. And I think this is where we lose track quickly is if we're not looking at our purpose. We are wired, I believe, as humans. Generally speaking, we are wired to work on something that's bigger than ourselves. And if we can tap into that, you know, it's, it's that old uh, story about the guy who walks up and sees the two bricklayers. And he asks the first guy, he says, what are you doing? The guy says, I'm laying bricks. And they're like, oh, interesting. He goes to the next guy, he's doing exactly the same thing. He says, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a cathedral. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the first place to start is why are we here? Why are we here together? What are we trying to achieve? Not just what's my pay going to be, what's my title going to be, what's my office and authority and all that kind of stuff. But who are we trying to serve? And I think we can get people tapped into that. We can start to change their mind about how they behave towards each other, towards mm -hmm. our customers, and towards the world itself. And I think that's really important. And now, as all of us leaders have learned over and over again, now you begin to over-communicate. Now you've got to tell the story, tell it well, tell it authentically. Because I think the most finely tuned sense of smell any human being has is for authenticity. They, they look to their leaders and they're, they're, they're deciding every day. Is this the person I still want to follow? Should I stay here? And so I think if you can tap into those basic things, you can actually start to mold people in a really good way. So, you know, I think we have great people here. There's no doubt. But these aren't the superstars. You know, this, you know everybody says we only hire the best of the brightest. Really? So where do all the worst and the dimmest go in the world, right? <laughs> you know, and it's like, no, it's not you hire the best and the brightest. I think it's that you, you get the best out of the people you have. And you do that by creating the right environment, the right culture, the right shared belief system. And if you do that, you can get extraordinary results out of regular human beings. And I think that's what you see when you come here. This is the most, I will tell you, this is the most unlikely group of people you would ever think to call a great team. If we went through each one of them and heard their stories, you'd be like, huh, it's amazing. This doesn't seem like the kind of people you, I mean, it, there's nothing wrong with anybody here. I'm just <laughs> you. It's not like we went to MIT and Cambridge and Oxford and Stanford and, and got, and oh, they got really, 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 really smart people. It's like, no, we got really good people here. There's no question about that. But it's not about that. It's about what you do with them when you have them in your room. Don't forget to find us and connect on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, at Barry Waymiller. And you can find more podcasts, articles, and videos at trulyhumanleadership.com. I'm Brent Stewart. Thanks for listening.